am not part of uh, the panel, just to keep your microphone on mute, but do engage with us uh, on the chat box. I would, I've got uh, three panelists joining us today, and they're going to introduce themselves to you. Nolo? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be on this panel today to share my ups and downs with you. Um, from Seven Colors uh, Eatery, which is currently a catering company that does deliveries. And we basically celebrate traditional South African food coming from my home and uh, from those South Africans living around us. Thank you. Michelle? Hi. Hi, I'm Michelle Mystery. I'm the owner of IndyCar. I am an Ayurvedic nutritionist, and I've created a range of products that support an Ayurvedic lifestyle. Thank you, Michelle. And Terence? Terence, are you with us? <laughs> He's on mute. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Am right. I in? Okay, yes, cool. Hi there. So I'm, I'm Terence Ford. I am the um, owner stroke only employee stroke delivery stroke everyone in my little business called Growth Kinetics. I specialize in uh, fermented foods and um, yeah, that's basically what, what I do. Okay, thank you. And if it wasn't clear from there, Terence is also a, a chef who has worked at many uh, 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 popular establishments around the country. Uh, so today, as you know, we're looking at particular challenges faced during, a, during the pandemic for food entrepreneurs and small businesses. And um, I would like to just start off by uh, reading something from a very recent Reuters report where when, Wendy Alberts, the Chief Executive Officer of the Restaurant Association of South Africa, said about 400 thousand jobs have been lost in the sector during the end of March, with more businesses closing their doors permanently every day. A recent survey by the ESIS group found that about 67% of restaurants were receiving less than 20% of their usual monthly turnover compared to July last year, while 90% of fine dining restaurants had stayed shut since the lockdown began. Now, of course, um, not all our panelists are necessarily directly involved in this kind of restaurant trade. I think it, uh, it definitely bears mentioning. And then secondly, I would like to share with you something from a McKinsey report, a recent one, that said uh, small to medium enterprises across South Africa represent more than 98% of businesses. They employ between 50 and 60% of the country's workforce across all sectors and they are responsible for a quarter of job growth in the private sector. And while the GDP contributions from South Africa's SMEs lag in other regions, 39% compared to 57 in the EU, there's no doubt that this sector is a critical engine of the economy. And I think that's just a, a, an important point for, a, a point for us to make and to digest as we start these, uh, this conversation and we hear the perspectives of uh, our panelists who are working in extraordinary circumstances. So I'd like to start off by asking you to share with us some of the changes in your work and business since March um, till yeah. today. Parents, <coughs> would you like to yes. kick off? Cool. Uh, I think for me, obviously the biggest thing that changed is um, I unfortunately got retrenched. Um, I was the executive chef at Sante Wellness um, Spa in, in Paul. And, um, you know, not just did I get retrenched, but, but the entire team, you know, ranging from all the, the chefs through to the, the therapists. Um, and, you know, it's obviously had a massive impact on, on so many. Um, you know, I get phone calls daily of, of people that I know that I've worked with that, um, that are unemployed. And I think, so I think for me, it was, it was a big shock because I never thought in my life that I would be in this position. You know, I always believed that uh, food is something that, that people can't live without food, you know? So I had this perception in my mind that the food industry would never be affected. But right now it's been affected probably the worst of, of many of, of the industries. So I think for me, my life has changed. Um, 360 
Um, and that's, that's meant that I've had to think about, you know, what can I do in, in, in this time until things hopefully go back to normal. Um, and that's where the, the inspiration sort of came about to do the fermented food range. Yes, and we will obviously get into unpack that a little more as we keep chatting. Mm -hmm. But uh, Michelle, uh, would you also like to, to weigh in here uh, about some of the okay. changes in work and business since March? Sure. I, so I, I, went to, I took um, a lot of my savings and I traveled to India in, in last year uh, to train as a, an Ayurvedic nutritionist. So Ayurveda is a 6,000 year old health science and Ayurvedic nutrition is a way of eating for your body type. So it's, it's, it's about health. Um, so I spent a lot of money being trained and then developing um, courses and workshops so it was all very much um, contact based and started doing that and was, was seeing um, massive um, appetite for it in the market. And I had a few uh, workshops booked right up to the end of April and came lockdown. I had to cancel all of them. And then now find a new way of still being responsive to the market and bringing what I have um, in a different way. So I went online. I always had a range, but I, I tailored it to make life and cooking easier, listening to how everybody complained about having to cook all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I made a few bottle products that just make cooking so much simpler. And then I started uh, online consulting. So instead of doing the workshops, I now consult online. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I might add that I have uh, tasted some of Michelle's uh, uh, products and they are really, really delicious. So Thank how you. are you able to pack all of that into a little bottle? <laughs> it still baffles me, <laughs> but <laughs> we can chat about that further. Uh, and how about you, Nolo, from your perspective? Um, so for me, before March, um, I was the girl who was out in the streets in Cape Town uh, cooking traditional South African food. Um, I'd also be at places like the Botanical Garden hosting picnics. I did events. So as much as my vision was, has always been to have an eatery, um, but to build product um, and to also introduce my product to the market, I used catering as a medium. And, and uh, how it happened, it was off-site uh, catering. Uh, where I'd also go into people's homes. And obviously I was no longer able to go to markets. I was no longer able to service uh, one of my cash cow clients, which would be the tourism uh, industry. And, um, and I think starting from last year, I started building a very, very good client base and uh, relationships in the tourism industry. And because of COVID-19, that has changed. Um, obviously, the borders are closed, so I can't service that market. And um, I can't go into people's homes. I can't go um, to parks. Uh, so my business has changed to a delivery service. Um, so that's how it's changed. OK. So for any new participants uh, joining us, my name is Ishe Govinder. I'm a journalist and I'm here representing SAPOC at the table. We just ask if you're not a panelist to keep your microphone on mute, but please uh, connect with us in the chat box if you have any comments, if you yourself have uh, been uh, working or running a small business and you've been facing challenges, feel free to engage, ask questions or even provide uh, any tips <laughs> that you may have garnered along the way. So uh, Terence, you mentioned, uh, you started telling us at, at the, just, just now that you were directly affected also in the initial stages of uh, the lockdown because you were one of the people who were retrenched and um, you know, it, it has become a frightening norm in the industry actually when you look at our friends and colleagues um, um, who, who, have, who have gone through this and who are going through this uh, as well. So uh, have you seen other friends and colleagues of yours, Terence, who are also trying to leverage their skills the way you have with Growth Kinetics? Um, what are the chefs who are sitting at home 
uh, or forced to sit at home and who didn't have, for example, mobile businesses or catering, what are they doing? What have you noticed? So I think, um, you know, if you're talking like for myself, for example, uh, the guys in my um, sort of category of chef, I think it's easier for us to start something uh, where we can have a, a delivery service or home cooked meals or something like that. Um, I've seen a lot of guys doing a very basic home cooked meal, that sort of platform. Um, and I think the sad thing is, is that anybody who in a kitchen structure is below me um, at the moment are doing very little. You know, a lot of them are depending on the uh, UIF, which is, I mean, we all know that's been a massive um, issue. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the guys are looking at, obviously, the home delivery sort of thing. And mm -hmm. at the moment, it's extremely challenging because this, the market is, it is ex it's flooded beyond. So mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of what the guys are doing is, is very basic um, menus, uh, trying to come up with with these home cooked meals that people can obviously afford because you know you're going up against a Woolies lasagna, for example, mm. or, or a Woolies uh, or, or Shoprite pie, chicken pie, for example. Mm. So you know you you kind of relying on your on your background and your skill to be able to uh, cook so that you can make a profit at least because doing this kind of thing is a lot of work for one for one person. So a lot of the guys are doing that. At the moment, the sad thing for me is, is uh, the people who are um, in the lower positions in our, in our kitchens are the ones who are, are sort of stuck, you know. Um, I, I haven't seen anyone in my kitchen. I've seen guys become Uber drivers. I've seen um, people just try and find ways to create some form of income, but it's nothing um, in, in this sort of line that we come from. Uh, I think that's probably the, the, the most challenging part of it. And, and as a chef who has been in charge of a team that you were very close to, I can imagine it's quite agonizing for you to watch um, and to know that there is really little recourse. I mean, we have covered on a previous panel uh, as well the plight of uh, um, migrant and, refu and uh, African refugees um, mm -hmm who are also a big part of the, the restaurant and service industry in South Africa, and as you know, are not, have not been granted any um, unemployment benefits or relief other than access to certain uh, organizations that work for uh, and on behalf of uh, refugees. And even that has been just in terms of mainly food parcels, which I think is the, has been the immediate need, hasn't it? Um, uh, Nola, we have, you were on our very first panel um, uh, two months ago, and we were speaking about, uh, you know, some of the, the, the you know, what, what, what restaurants and eateries and caterers were going through. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I suppose things have changed since then, but perhaps not very much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, you, you, we've, we've discussed stuff, and one of the things you have mentioned is having any <coughs> kind of stuff now is a kind of luxury you can't afford, also there's safety concerns, but at the same time, how do you support the stuff that you may have had before? Would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, it's, uh, certainly it's been uh, very, very uh, challenging because um, as I mentioned uh, before, it's kind of like going into a whole totally new um, business. And when I initially, initially started, the idea was like, okay, no, Lou, you can do this. You can cook, you can service people, and you can do the whole thing, you know, chopping, cleaning. And um, at the time, my husband was also available to assist me in doing the deliveries. Um, but you can only do so much uh, deliveries by yourself, the cooking, the cleaning, and you need the staff. Um, and once you get the staff in, you then start to realize as much as they, you have them in, now there's less money to work with. So uh, for me, it's really been a dilemma. Um, it's having staff when I need them, when I have a lot of orders 
and at times I just support them in terms of uh, groceries to make sure that they have food on the table. Um, but when it comes to it making financial sense, it's been a very, very uh, difficult situation. So um, each and every like week is planned according to how many deliveries we have. And then I decide if I can be able to afford staff to come in. And um, it's been such a difficult position for me because as much as I have a team, um, I also have to look after myself, you know. Um, yeah, so that's been basically my experience. Yeah. Um, so, Terence, we had just started to cover something earlier where you mentioned that, you know, now you're up against, for example, Willie's lasagna or you're up against uh, a family-sized pie, uh, stuff like that, because uh, we all know that cooking from scratch is not necessary, and, and I must go ahead, sorry, let me add this as an aside, cooking from scratch is not necessarily cheaper, and certainly people going back to work, it is, it is becomes from, you know, that uh, a novelty of cooking on the weekends in a leisurely fashion to now a chore, a job. So the point I want to make is, you know, what are some of the trends that you are seeing with consumers? Because we've definitely all had to make do with much less compared to previously. But I also wonder if people are not spending more, um, maybe not on food, but because they are, you know, uh, constantly in this online situation with access to plastic credit cards. And I wonder if we are also not spending excessively for this uh, to make up psychologically to make up for the restrictions that, that are placed on us. So that's a sort of a twofold question there, but Terence, you were saying that you have noticed that the chefs are, are preparing meals that can potentially compete with that of a Woolies or a pick and pay or something like that. Can you tell us about some of the trends that you have noticed? So I think for me, obviously, you know, you, you have your, your restaurants um, that haven't closed and they doing their own sort of um, they're doing their food in a takeaway, um, home delivery sort of platform. But a lot of the guys who, who aren't as lucky, um, they, the food they're doing is sort of uh, what we would call sort of banqueting style food. So it's your curries, it's your lasagnas, mm -hmm. it's your pies, um, you know, and also it's food that can, that can hold in a delivery sort of mm -hmm. um, environment. Uh, because there's, you know, there's no point in creating something that is, you know, that is, is not going to last in, in your delivery um, sort of platform. Also, packaging is super expensive. You know, all of these little containers, the, it is very, very expensive. So a lot of the guys are, are looking at costs, you know, their costs are, are massive. Um, and, to, and to make things like lasagna and curry and, and that sort of food, um, you don't make much, but you don't spend as much because you can, you can produce volume like that. So that's what I'm sort of seeing. Uh, the guys are, are, are preparing um, more often. And, and like I say, you know, it's a lot of work for one person. So it's easier to make food that you could do 30 or 40 um, in one go than have different little options with all these little um, ingredients or aspects that you want to add to it. So you keep it as 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 basic as possible. And I've seen that's what the trend has, has sort of become. Yeah, but it's very important that you mention the packaging. I know we have discussed this previously in Nolo, where you also spoke about the lack of having the personal touch. So you try to make up with it for it in the way you package and Nolo also packages her, her foods beautifully. Uh, so much so that you could also just eat directly from the container. Nolo, I have no idea how you're able to serve that food warm. I mean, yeah. when I have ordered from you, it, it arrives warm, ready for the yeah. table, which also makes me, uh, made, has made me think the amount of effort that you would have to, to put into the delivery of a single meal. And I think in both my, exp uh, in my experiences, your husband was delivering, del yeah. delivering it. And you also mentioned that in him, you had somebody, you have somebody who mm -hmm. understands precisely how everything from the way you'd like it to be delivered, the visual is so important mm -hmm. as well. So I'm just making this point um, to acknowledge the, um, the effort and the cost that goes into uh, 
putting these packages together. And I have tried my very best to support uh, restaurants and eateries across the board. And you will see those who actually have access to the big kitchens are the ones who uh, you know, are adding their garnishes on the side and that kind of thing. Mm. And I admire the kind of labor and the time and also the, the price point, if, if you think about it. Mm. So um, I would like to know uh, from you, so Nola, you had said that with the food markets initially, closed initially and without international football coming in, you've, who, they've been your primary clientele mm. and you have lost that. You've also said that the pandemic has meant starting a whole new way of doing business. Example delivery, which we were discussing now with, with Terence as well is, is a challenge. Um, and when you start a new business, there are meant to be failures along the way. COVID gives us no room to fail. This is what you have said. Mm. Please elaborate. Well, I mean, I just remember when I also started my business, like the first year was purely testing and failing. Um, and with COVID-19, if I'm going to move from a company that used to cater offsite and uh, start delivering, it's a new ball game. And I'm still learning. I'm still testing product. But uh, my failures means less income. And I can, sometimes I feel like I cannot afford to fail in this regard. I have to get my costing right from scratch um, because I've got clients that are price sensitive. So if month one, I cost a certain way, I can't all of a sudden month two change the prices, you know? Um, so I feel for me, it's really been pressure in that regard where there is no room to play and uh, room to play means loss in income and at this time I can't afford to lose income then you have things like equipment I just like I want to invest uh, let's say on a bigger stove um, so it's a hard decision to actually as much as I know that's the need if I invest on a big stove, is that going to really give me returns in this kind of environment? Mm -hmm. um, so it really has been that challenge in the sense that I feel like um, I have to get things right because there are these financial pressures. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's how I feel. Two quick things, Nolo. Mm -hmm. One, where, where are you currently preparing your food? Okay, so my food at the moment is prepared um, at my home. Um, so I've got a kitchen and uh, over the years, I mean, it's worked for me because my events were very, very small and intimate. Uh, uh, so I would do uh, 10 people uh, for a picnic um, or I would go into someone's home as a private chef. So the equipment that I had was more than enough uh, for uh, my clients that I service. Uh, but now with deliveries, you catering um, for more than 10 people in a day. You need to prepare. If you have a small team, you have to prepare way in advance. You need uh, bigger storage uh, facilities. Um, and also with us really being crazy, competing with deliveries and giving people warm food, um, you also have to prepare uh, like three different orders at once. Um, so it's, you actually need an industrial kitchen. Um, so yeah, that me. Okay, thank you. So from everything that everyone is saying, you know, we know that the uncertainties, the risks involved in starting something like this, or should, and in some cases, reinventing along the way, there are plenty, the risks are plenty. You've got bills to pay, you've got staff to keep on, or perhaps you can't keep them on, but at the same time, you can't keep up with the amount that you need to make without that stuff. Michelle, what has been your experience with this as far as IndyCarp goes? What do you mean, the, the changes? So some, with regard to the uncertainties and you know, you've, you've, you've got bills to pay, you've got staff to keep on and you've got to weigh that the entire time. Can I keep them on? Uh, do I let them go? Uh, I'm not yeah. making a, a profit. Um, you know, sales are up or sales are down. How, what's your experience been? Yeah, there's this saying that I, I saw this morning. It said, how do I find, I can't see my way out to the woods. Um, it's it's um, a little boy and a horse. And the horse says, well, can you see 
the space just in front of you? And the boy says, yes. And, and the horse says, yeah, take that step. So it's, it's been really difficult to plan like too far, in, you know, too far ahead because you don't, you don't really know what the future is going to hold. So from week to week, things change. Um, I, I took on a um, veg box delivery just so that I could actually get into the market so people could access my stuff. Um, and it went really, it grew like really slowly and then gathered momentum. And then we ended lockdown and everybody stopped buying. So the market is so fickle at the moment. You can't expect people to be consistent or to be loyal because they experiencing the same thing you are. There's constant change and they've got to make decisions at the drop of a hat about how much money they have available to spend. So you can't plan too far in the future. Uh, you can't base too many decisions on what your brand's going to look like or what your product's going to be three months down the line. You really have to go by the feel of the market at the moment. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I know Nola mentioned uh, to me previously was that everyone is working harder for less. And I think that's, uh, that's felt consistently across the board in food businesses and in others as well. Um, and uh, in order to achieve what I want to achieve, I need investment, you say, Nolo. But all those conversations are on hold due to COVID-19. So one of the McKinsey findings in the report I quoted earlier says that SMEs are at a disadvantage because of lack of knowledge on how to access public sector funding with the reasons ranging from I wasn't aware I was qualified to I don't know how to access it. I would like all of you to weigh in on this in terms of uh, you know, funding from the public sector, from government or from other bodies. Um, Terence, did you know that you are qualified for anything? Did you have, did you go down this path at all in your journey with Growth Kinetics? No, not at all. Um, for me, Growth Kinetics has just been sort of more personal um, investment in my, in my own. Uh, I haven't looked for any support or, or anything like that. But uh, going down the line, would you be interested in working with... Uh, either funders or if there was some way for you to access funding from the public sector? Yeah, I mean, for me, that's a, that's a definite uh, because I realized that just starting this is, you know, as small as it might be, it's not cheap. Um, there's so much that you, that you take on, there's so much that you take in, into consideration when you, when you do sort of um, decide to go on your own. So if, if, these, if there's funds or if there's any form of support that's, that's made available by government for people like us, uh, I think that's, that's great. I, I don't, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I, I would never have thought that there would be any funds available, you know, just, just like honestly. Um, but if there is a possibility of getting that little bit of, of leverage, I think it would be brilliant. On this note, uh, I'd love to ask you, what would be useful to you? Someone who has, uh, uh, you know how a kitchen works, you know how to do crustings, and you've started, you've started a business where you're selling these fermented products. Right now, what would be extreme, except for a boat full of money, what would be extremely <laughs> useful to you? So I think for me, it's, it's where the, the position I find myself in is that, um, with this type of product, it's not a, a product that a lot of people are aware of. So I find that I have to do quite a bit of uh, marketing in terms of adding a bit of um, information or building, building the story around what it is that I'm selling. So I've had to find ways, for example, of doing lots of tastings, uh, lots of free sampling, um, I've had to do quite a bit of uh, designing of different uh, packages of information um, just so that people can actually understand what it is um, that fermented foods or what growth kinetics actually is. Um, I find that 
that a lot of the stores um, right now that I've approached, you know, your faithful to nature, your wellness warehouse, they've all turned me down completely. Um, and none of them want to give me a, a reason why. But in my mind, I'm, I'm beginning to feel like the only reasons that they are not sort of buying into my product is because they don't have the retail knowledge of, of this type of food. You know, they don't understand that it's alive. It's, it's a living sort of product. Um, and so, I mean, if there's, if there's any funding that could help me establish more of a, um, a marketing platform, you know, to maybe be a little bit more professional or mm. to help me uh, get to some of the, the big guns who would actually believe in something like this, you know, that would, that's the support that I'm, that I'm sort of looking for. I'm not looking for a lot of cash because you know, as Nolu said, you're working from your home kitchen. You know, I don't have an industrial kitchen, so I need to look at, I mean, my kitchen at the moment is full of jars and bottles. And, you know, so there's only so much I can do at a, at a time. Um, so I think if I had to look for support, it would be uh, from like a marketing um, um, aspect to get um, into a certain sort of bracket uh, of where I could put my product forward. Uh, not only from a nutritional um, sort of information aspect, because I think that's, that's also a reason why a lot of them are not investing is because I don't have that nutritional, you know, that little thing at the back of the mm. jar that says the proteins and the this and the that, you know, to send a product away for testing on that food. is, it's extremely expensive. So, you know, I think that's my situation that I, that I find myself in now. Okay. And at the end of this, uh, everyone will drop their details so uh, we can go and check, check it out and see, uh, see what it's about. Michelle, I think that this would also speak to you, this, very, uh, this aspect, because you are, while your product is not the same, you're in a similar situation creating um, products that are bottled for use. Um, what's your experience been? Pretty much the same. So I think for me, the biggest help would be access to markets. Um, I find that it, all of the retail stores are, are hard to get into. So, um, and I, I don't know why that is. So I haven't yet figured out why that is. Um, for instance, Faithful to Nature wants you to fill out like quite a big long spreadsheet with all of the nutritional information of your products. They don't firstly supply or they don't uh, sell any cold, um, yeah, any, any cold chain products. So to have your product nutritionally tested costs 2000 Rand per product. So for any small, you know, producer, that's crazy. It's like 11 products. So to get each of them tested, I would have to choose one of them and, and mm -hmm. go through it. Even that would be, and then getting in stores or getting access to markets for me is, is the thing. What I was wondering is if we could have, so um, all of the online delivery stores, they take up to 45 or 50% of your, from, from, of your price, they add on 45%. To the selling price. I mean, crazy. So the, the guys who are selling your product are taking almost half of the profit. So there has to be some other model. There's got to be something else that works where the people who are actually doing the work get more than, you know, like a small slim amount of, of, of the money that comes back. So for me, that's issue getting access to the market because um so terence i can always we can always sit together i'm i'm uh, a marketing specialist it's what i've done um finances and access to the market if we could help get help there that would be awesome i think yeah if, uh, if we if, if there is some way in which we could get direct access to the market or to have it easier to get access to retail stores um that would be great well, I love this. And if there are other people you know, from the SAPA community who want to get involved or have other skills, this would be fantastic if you have a, a round table or a round Zoom table and uh, you know, put your heads together with everything that you have uh, 
garnered along the way and uh, share your skills. Um, I'm, oh, I've got, on, on this note, I must say, when we speak, speak about the companies that you've mentioned, they seem to be very invested in, uh, in health and wellness, or at least selling a, a lifestyle that uh, is based on health and wellness and a feeling of, of uh, treating yourself well. And certainly both the types of products in Ayurveda is, uh, is known for this and uh, uh, fermented foods as well. So it seemed to me that what you're offering is an ideal product. But at the same time, <clears throat> I suppose if you came up, if you came up with a, 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 a new turmeric <laughs> latte, <laughs> it would be an easier take. But uh, let me not stir the pot there. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, let, let's continue. So I, I want to uh, speak about stress and anxiety. Because I think that this is, you know, these are realities that affect our productivity. And all the conversations you're having now, you didn't have to say to me, I feel stressed out or anxious. Not that I'm picking that from you, but certainly the weight of what you're discussing. You know, you're trying to keep yourself alive. You're trying to keep your business afloat, not knowing what that next step is, like the little boy and the horse. You're also very concerned about your staff, your family members, your own personal safety safety of your uh, consumers and customers. There's a lot going on. And I feel that in this um, industry, we don't address the topics of stress and anxiety enough, or rather should I say, we sometimes give it a nod when it's popular to do so. If there's a big write up from, um, you know, a, a, a glossy, popular glossy magazine, then, then maybe we will be willing to address it. But, you know, our ability to create and our self-worth uh, also depend, and our productivity depends on our state of being. And what's your, your experience been with, with this? Nolo? It's really, to be honest, it's been a very, very tricky and a hard time because um, as a person that manages people, uh, people are looking for leadership from your side. You know, um, they're looking to relieve they are stresses, they are family issues um, through you, you know, because um, obviously the money or our pockets for all of us, um, uh, we've been severely affected. Um, and it's been very, very difficult for me to manage that because I don't always have the answers and um, talking uh, in, in terms of my team. Um, also, we are put in a place where we have to think about the future. You know, when you're in business, you're constantly thinking, um, where am I taking my business? And sometimes it's not easy to answer those questions when you look at the environment. Um, do I get a kitchen space and open up and run a delivery company? Um, it, it, it's a very difficult decision to make. Do I... Um, I've always wanted to open a restaurant in Cape Town. Do I now go and open a restaurant in Cape Town during these, these hard times? Um, and at the same time, if you're working so hard, I look at myself personally, um, I work very, very hard. And I mean, I have a family and there's less time for family. So that uh, puts in a lot of stress and anxiety. So really for me, it's just not being 100%. It's not like you always certain um, but it's just not being certain what the future really looks like and you can sit down and try and reimagine how uh, the future will look like but uh, that uncertainty um, mm. has brought about a lot of anxiety in my business and also in my personal life. Mm. Uh, Michelle? Yeah the same I think stress levels are incredibly high um, it, there's what, what I've experienced with my clients as well as with myself it's like all of your roles have collided in your in your lounge or in your dining room it's like you are mother father uh, teacher um, boss whatever everything all at the same time in the same place and firstly trying to just create boundaries that work and to continue doing everything you need to do and get it done on time and fluidly and effectively it's just impossible and, the, and it, because those boundaries are so blurred now it's like we expect um we expect people to respond immediately 
you know it's like we have a zoom call you in my lounge i'm speaking to you and we you know when when you send an email you want an immediate response so there, there isn't the room that we used to have to have to do the things we used to do it's like everything now is sort of concentrated and obviously that increases your stress plus the uncertainty of the decisions making the choices for you and your family plus the health issues so uh, yeah, there's a lot of stress yeah I find that, um i've had to create routines that i stick to to be able to deal with it so in order to keep myself calm keep myself relaxed to be creative to access resources um in a full way i've had to create routine mm -hmm. so my saving grace thank you for sharing that and uh, terence uh you're a, you're a new dad yeah. So that, that has been a, a gift that, that also arrived at the start of the lockdown, I recall. Yeah. And what, what, how have things been for you there? So, I mean, I, I got retrenched a day before he was born. Um, and oh. uh, so, I mean, that's, that's, that was quite an interesting um, dynamic. But I think for me, you know, being in, in my position and, and, and being a leader of, of people and having teams, you know, it's, I think for me, it's been, it's been quite difficult when I think about my team, you know, and my staff and you build these relationships with these, with these people and now it's gone. You know, you don't know what's going on. You don't know if they're okay. I mean, I've had cases where um, some of my staff don't have, for example, uh, they're not getting the UIF. Um, so even although they, they're not my sort of employees, you still feel that level of responsibility toward them to try and help them out where they should be contacting the owners or whatever the case might be. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still the guy they, they run to and I try and, and help the best I can. So I think for me, it's just, I think that's been quite a, a downer is, is my team. You know, it's, yeah. it's just, it is what, this is the industry we work in. Um, and then also like on a, on a personal level, I, it took me a long time to accept my situation. And mm -hmm. when, when, when I stopped, when I got my last salary, that's when I realized, okay, you know, the game has changed completely, you know, and you, you, you know, there's so much going on. There's the media, it's, you know, it's this COVID thing. It's the media, it's, this is closing down. That is, you know, everything is just such a, a negative all the time. I got to a point where I woke up one morning and I said to myself, okay, so you've got one of two choices. It's either you're going to try and do something or you're just going to end up doing nothing. You know, and and that's when I when I thought, you know what, like I I might I might not be able to do these takeaway meals and all the rest of it, but let me start off with something that I know I was doing, you know, and that's mm -hmm. where the fermented sort of side comes from because that's what I did quite a lot of, and mm -hmm. you know the feedback I would get from guests where this kind of food um, is concerned is was quite a lot and doing my research, I realized that there's not a lot of, of fermented foods on, on the market. Um, if it is on the market, it's not local, it's imported, it's processed, it contains chemicals, it's not natural. So, you know, I sat down and I thought, okay, cool, so let's, let's give this a try. And, you know, if I didn't make that decision, uh, I think I would have been in a lot worse mental um, space than what I am right now. But along with that comes the new challenges where you knock on the doors and you get turned away, you know? And yeah. so it's, you know, as, as much as you try, like I find, and I think about it mentally, as much as you try and, and, and dig yourself out of this hole, um, you become so excited about your product in the, in the, um, the design of it, getting it together, you know, that first batch, the information, the artisanal side of it, you know, then you approach a few of these corporate dudes and they knock you down um, immediately. So I think that's been my sort of battle, but I, I've learned to just get over myself. And, you know, mm -hmm. if they're going to take it, they're going to take it. If they're not, it's cool. We'll just keep sort of moving. I and I think that's the only approach you can have um, right now. Otherwise, you, you literally just walk into a brick wall, you know, every second of your day. Well, as a freelance writer who should have a thick 
skin. You know, you see the constant rejection. I wish I had something positive to add that, you know, after 11 odd years that it gets uh, easier to accept because mm. you think you conceptualize this idea and you're like, this is a story I must tell and you can't get through. But what I want to say you have uh, to your advantage is baby cuddles. So I'm pretty yeah, sure yeah. <laughs> there are many things, the little kiss or cuddle from a, from a, a newborn is, uh, would, would help to cure. So we've been speaking of a lot of hard lessons, Nolo, Terence, Michelle, um, I would like to know going forward from, uh, you know, is there anything that sticks in your mind? I know that we're, it's an unfair question to ask because you're still in the middle of it, that we're all trying to figure out whatever, you know, the professions that we're in, we're trying to still figure out what lies ahead. What would we like to lie ahead? What does this ideal world look like if, if there is one? But when we look at some of the hard lessons that we've learned, is there anything that you think you, you're going to be taking forward or you're not going to be doing again or that has changed your perspective on, on who you are in your profession and who you are as a person. Nolo? I think for me, COVID-19 really helped me to see how big of a community that I, I have. Mm -hmm. And previously I was just working, minding my own business all by myself. And I just realized, and I'm so grateful for that, uh, that I've got people around me and I don't necessarily have to do what I'm doing on my own. And I feel that's the lesson. And, and again, I'd say the opportunity that, um, that, that, that has come because of COVID-19. I've had friends, I mean, even from Sepok, Nolu, send me your food. Um, I will do styling for you, you know. Nolu, do you need uh, marketing or social media advice? And previously, as a small business person, I was struggling all by myself, and I just didn't know how to reach people because in my mind, it always seemed like if I don't have money to pay you, why might I ask for your service, which is the wrong way of thinking and approaching things. And uh, COVID-19 has given me the opportunity to that people's hearts are so big and um, what I'm learning to do now is to reach out more um, and I feel going forward and uh, and I feel that's actually going to be how I'm going to win as a business and how I'm going to succeed is by inviting people into my space and being more open and um, and collaborating more um, for instance I've got a collaboration that I do with uh, Afro Grow, and uh, this collaboration came only because I collaborated with Andy Ferner, and now I'm providing them with products every single week. And um, previously, I wouldn't have done something like that because I was like, oh no, I don't want to dilute my brand or dilute my product. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've learned how to collaborate, and um, and yeah, and I mean, I'm reaching out to my big sisters in the food industry, like uh, like Karen and um, how she's advised me on going forward. So um, as much as there's a lot to, to stress about and a, a lot of uncertainty, but there's also been big positives in my life because of this uh, time, yeah. That's, that's really great. And on that note, from a support perspective, I also want, want to add, to Terence and to Michelle, it also just occurred to me that there are people in the community who uh, would probably be very happy to uh, style your products and if, if that's something that you need, help to, mm. to distribute it to a larger market. And I can obviously put my stamp on all of your products because I- Of course you do, oh. always. <laughs> and, uh, no, they're, and they're great and I wouldn't if, if they weren't, but um, I think that's a really good idea to tap into the community and I know, Michelle, that was also something that you were looking for in terms of your uh, product to reach also to reach a greater POC market um, as well. Uh, in terms of these hard lessons, Michelle, do you, would you like to weigh in here? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I'm actually grateful for COVID because it's, it's given me focus. Uh, it's made me really think about what's needed rather than what I like doing. Um, and it, it, it's made me position my product in a way that 
that I know there's going to be someone who actually wants to have it rather than just make a fantastic product because it's something I think is nice. Um, so it, yeah, it's made me hone on what are the needs that are not being met. And with limited resources and limited time, you really have to force yourself to be creative and to collaborate. So you can't sit by yourself and you don't have endless amounts of anything. So you've got to really use all of your resources with intention and with, um, what's the word? With wisdom, even though, even though it's hard, it's, it's like it forces you to connect with what really is meaningful, um, what lasts, what's sustainable, and what works for other people as well. So if anything, I feel like COVID makes you sort of cut everything down to the bone. And in that, in that sort of sharp focus, you actually get more value than you would if you had access to all of the other things you usually do. So in that respect, it's been great. I mean, it's been hard on, on, on many fronts, but for, for my business, that's been good for me, being able to drill down and find out why am I doing this? Well, I must say th Sorry, you said that is a very liberating viewpoint. You could also be the first person I have heard speaking with gratitude for COVID. And perhaps this is something that we need to channel in ourselves. Because we're all building a lot of too, as much as we have mm. You know, perhaps we've been all spending more time than we normally would uh, with ourselves. So, um, so thank you for that. And uh, so there are a couple of other things I would love to ask you too, but I just thought um, building on something else that you had mentioned previously, Michelle, about reimagining a future and creating a, a new system of the economy. You know, obviously this is not something that any one of us can uh, put together in a mandate and propose to other uh, entrepreneurs, but we are seeing small shifts in, in how people consume in how we consume ourselves. So in an ideal world, what would a reimagined new system of economy look like? Um, For me, it's very much based, based on community life and the value of things or, or valuing things that are valuable. So um, as a mom, I, I've been a stay-at-home mom for 15 years. And at the end of that time, now my kids are back at school and I've got to get back into um, the working economy and the f past 15 years that I've spent nurturing my family means absolutely nothing. Okay, so when, when, you, when you actually connect with that fact that the thing that you found most valuable in your life actually has no monetary value in the biggest society that you can offer no value or no value that anybody's willing to pay for in, in larger society, that is incredibly nerve-wracking. It's frustrating. Mm. It makes you angry. I'd like to see a society that actually values, that values the things that matter, that values the things that make life worth living and where everybody can get a piece of the pie where you don't have to suffer through your life and at the end of it feel like, what did you do all of this for? So mm -hmm. that what we do is connected to a real sense of value and not lining someone's pocket, like paying 45% <laughs> of the, the real price to someone who's just delivering your goods. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see greater um, what parity between what yeah. you put in and what you actually receive. And as a consumer who often purchases as well from some of the uh, uh, companies that you, you and Terence have mentioned, I must say I am, I should know better, but I am surprised. I had no idea that that was the markup placed on, on your product. And I imagine it also puts a lot of pressure on you to reduce the cost of the product you're offering because you're just priced out of the market if you had to get uh, what is potentially fair. You know, um, yeah. on that note of reimagining a future, Terence, feel free to disagree with everybody here and, and, and tell us that you want to go back <laughs> to what we had before. <laughs> How do you feel about this? 
so I think for me, you know, my first love and, and passion and desire is, is, is being a chef and, and being in the hospitality industry. So, I mean, I would love to just go back to the, to the norm, you know. Um, for me, myself, I'm not an entrepreneur. I've never been that minded you know i've always been sort of a chef working um in different properties so this is very very new to me and you know i i think I, as a chef you know you take things very personal um and that's also been a bit of a change where i've had to just like uh, things that that i know are good and someone else is not willing to see that i've had to change myself to to learn to accept that so there's been a few obviously a few changes um i think for me you know, the first thing I'd like to say is, is, is really a big up to all the owners of businesses that have tried to keep their staff on. Um, that even if just like paying, but is that they've just tried to help that they've made the sacrifice to help, you know, other people. So, I mean, I've those guys, oh. can you, am I there? Yes, yeah, sorry, you've, you've froze okay. for a second, but you're oh, back. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, like big ups to the guys who have, to, who have taken the sacrifice to sort of um, to look after their staff, to provide for their teams, even if it's just a little bit. So, you know, I'm very happy and, and that's, that's quite positive. Um, and then I think for me, it's like with this whole COVID thing, you know, we, it, there needs to be a point where it's more, it's more positive, where we start speaking more about the recoveries than what we're speaking about the deaths. You know that I mean, my mom is diabetic. She she had COVID, and she's back at work. You know, um, it's and 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 I just think that there needs to be a shift in terms of that, um, because I think that plays on on so many people's minds um, mentally. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, the media it's always just bad. It's always bad. When are we going to start interviewing these cases of people? that have these chronic illnesses that have survived, you know, that it's just, mm-hmm. a, it's a psyche that changes. Um, and then I think for, for, for our industry, you know, my heart bleeds for the industry because it's an industry that probably has, a, has a very high level of unskilled people. You mm-hmm. know, my chefs in my kitchen, 70% of them are not qualified. They, they come out of the townships, they were scholars, you know, they train up, they become chefs. A lot of the waiters, are not European waiters that have been trained that are, that earn you know these people come out of the the townships. So when you shut down hospitality, can you only imagine how much people um, that is affected? Where mm-hmm. the four of us can sit here and we can comfortably say we're okay, but when you look at when you look at the amount of unskilled people um, in our country that come from those areas that have nothing now, you know, I think that's that's where my heart really sort of uh, uh, bleeds for, for I think, the broader picture of, of what our industry is facing. Um, I think for me, you know, why not just, you know, let's kind of like go back to things, but, but let's be the new normal. Let's be more cautious. Let's, you know, why doesn't the government put into, into place um, uh, um, training on, on how to, training on, on, on how to, um, be a little bit more cautious or, you know, those kind of, of measures I feel they should be focusing on um, then taking these massive loans that we're going to all end up having to pay back, you know? So I think for me right now, I'm, I'm very positive, uh, purely based on seeing my mom's um, results and how she recovered. So that's been a big positive for me. And it makes me feel like at some point the pressure pot is it's, it's the lid is gonna is gonna come off and we're gonna be forced to go back into um into industry it might not be what it was but i think just some movement um, yeah. is gonna be is gonna be good movement and on that note of course it's so tricky and complicated as you and all of us are aware because we also have a public who is not necessarily 100 percent ready well certainly i'm not <clears throat> to engage in the old dining habits that that we had we have, uh, you know, workers who they and, and also employees who don't exactly know if they can keep everyone safe, including themselves. You know, I've spoken to many chefs with different perspectives, and I suppose it all depends where they are as well in terms of are they owners, are they, you know, head chefs, are they working in, in kitchens? And the bottom line is everybody wants um, 
uh, everybody needs to survive and everybody wants things to recover, but how and is it going to present itself, you know, going forward? Um, I think there's a lot to think about, but there have been small movements and we need to, as you said, focus on those. And even if they're tiny, highlight the, the successes mm -hmm. uh, in those. Uh, Michelle, I just want to mention very quickly, because when you were speaking about um, the unpaid, unvalued and undervalued worth of motherhood, uh, journalist Liz Lenz has a beautiful piece out that I read last night, so I'm just going to mention it here. It's in Time magazine, and she says, I wrote about how we absolutely need to abolish our concept of motherhood, burn it to the ground, stop valorizing it and start treating it as an essential part of our economy. So for anyone who wants to have a look at that, there's another part to the issue there that uh, yeah. you can look at. So I think there's... mothers should be paid. Sorry, I, have to, I just have to say, I think mothers should be paid for the work that they do. It should yeah. come out from, from the, from the uh, country's economy. Somehow we should look for ways to pay mothers. Because if you get married, mm -hmm. you have children, and then you get divorced, that it's just... How do women start over again with nothing? It's crazy, crazy, crazy that in this day and age that you could, you could even expect a woman to do that. It's crazy. And just to add on to this, to, to the point, because it affects our industry as well, um, as well, there are many, many women who are not able to take care of their own children because they are tasked with having to take care of both home, in order to, to survive as well. It's a choice they make, but they, it's a choice they make within the framework of, of you know, the, uh, the circumstances that we have currently. And so they end up taking care of other people's children so that you could work in the kitchen, you know, for your X amount of shift. And so we all end up relying on each other. But at some point, at, uh, when we look, when we reflect, there's a hierarchy as well of who is labor is valued more. And that, that's a fascinating conversation, but of course, um, uh, would love to unpack that in, in another discussion. Um, on that note, I know that we have reached our, our time. I want to thank you so much for your courage uh, in keeping your, uh, your businesses alive, in uh, reinventing in many, in many instances. And I hope that everybody in the SAPOC community and outside will support you. On this note, I would like to end uh, by asking you to share some of your social media details. This video will be up on SAPOC, www.sapoctable.com. It will be on our, web, on our YouTube channel very soon as well. We look forward to engaging with you on Instagram at um, SAPOC Table. And uh, Michelle, Norlo, Terence, thank you for your time. Please share your social media details and uh, look forward to supporting you, watching your journey and learning from you as we go forward. Michelle? Thanks so much. Thanks, Ishe. Um, you can find me on IndyCarp, I-N-D-I-K-A-A-P. So that's both on Facebook and on Instagram. And thank you so much, Ishe, and to Nolo and Terence. Nice to get to know you. Great. You're welcome. Nolo? Um, I'm at seven colors um, eat, uh, underscore eatery on Instagram. And uh, for any information regards to delivery, 0837297816. And thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everyone um, who was on the panel today. I uh, love learning all the time from all of us. <laughs> Terence? Uh, so you can get me on um, info at growthkinetics.co.za. Uh, my Instagram handle is growthkinetic for mints. And on Facebook as well, also just growthkinetics. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, thanks, thanks for putting this together. Isha, you know, just, it just gives us that moment where we can escape our reality and just connect with people who are <laughs> facing the same sort of struggles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's always great to get this out because you, you know, at the moment we also isolated, we, we in quarantine, so we don't have these conversations. Um, so thanks for, for putting this together. No, you, you are so welcome. And I've also found my experience of these panels being more like us, like in the old days, sitting over coffee and brainstorming, how are we going to take over the mm. world? Or how can I support you mm. to do this and that, which, which has also been, you know, Sapox, um, uh, one of Sapox's goals. So this is temporarily we have a screen between us. But all yeah. of you, thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you. have a wonderful weekend.
Take care. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.